Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video where today I'm not talking about much of a mystery at all. I suppose this could be a solved case. This has been highly requested and seeing as it's been in the news quite a lot recently due to the FBI closing down their investigation on it, I figured it's the perfect time for me to finally talk about it. This is the murder of Emmett Till, a young black boy lynched in Mississippi in 1955. After his death, he became an icon of the civil rights movement and it's said that when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, she was thinking of Emmett as she did so. Emmett Till was born on July 25th, 1941 in Chicago, Illinois, the son of Mamie Carthen Till and Lewis Till. Emmett was raised in a working class neighbourhood on the south side of Chicago by his mother and maternal grandmother. Mamie and Lewis had separated the year after Emmett was born when it was discovered that he'd been unfaithful to her. Lewis was a violent man and he would abuse Mamie, forcing her to take out a court order against him and eventually he was arrested for violating the court orders to stay away from Mamie and given a choice, go to jail or enlist in the army, which he does in 1943. He serves in the Italian campaign but is soon arrested by the military police who suspected him and another man of the murder of an Italian woman and the rape of two others. Lewis was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. He died in July 1945 and therefore Emmett was raised without his father. However, Mamie was never told of the reason behind her husband's execution, only that it was due to willful misconduct and any effort made to get more information was always blocked by the United States Army bureaucracy. The full details had only come out 10 years later. Mamie Carthen Till herself had been born in the small Delta town of Webb, Mississippi in the Deep South. Mississippi was one of the poorest states in the USA and the Delta counties were amongst the poorest in Mississippi. There were no opportunities and no money, especially for a black family. So when Mamie was still young, her family migrated up north to Argo, Illinois in search of a better life. She went on to grow up in the north, meet Lewis, get married, have Emmett. Mamie and Emmett eventually moved to Detroit together where Mamie met and married another man, but this was a relatively short-lived marriage. Emmett preferred Chicago though, so he returned back to Chicago to live with his grandmother and Mamie rejoined shortly after. Whilst Emmett attended a segregated elementary school in Chicago and definitely lived under racism, it wasn't necessarily the centre of his world. Compared to the Deep South anyway, Chicago was relatively free. He spent all of his free time with his cousins and his friends, he loved to play baseball, he was the kind of kid who was always the centre of attention and he loved it. By 1955, Emmett was 14 years old. He was about five foot four, but he was very stocky. He was about 150 pounds, and people often thought he was older than he was. His uncle, Mose Wright, still living in Mississippi, had come to visit the Tills up in Chicago earlier that summer, and had told Emmett stories about life down in the South. And Emmett decided he wanted to see it for himself, see where the rest of his family lived. Mamie wasn't keen on the idea of Emmett going down south, she knew of the kind of racism that he'd faced down there, but he begged and begged and eventually she relented. Emmett could go and spend a holiday with his cousins in Money, Mississippi. It was a tiny town with only a few hundred residents, three stores, a school, a post office and a cotton gin. The Mississippi Delta was a place where racial attitudes are now considered abhorrent were the norm for the majority of society. White people thought absolutely nothing of their racism. It was fully believed with every ounce of their being that they were the superior race. They were better than black people. The Jim Crow laws were the framework through which the races interacted down there and the laws were just not pushed. Despite the fact that the Mississippi Delta was actually populated by majority of black citizens. It was mostly black, but yet the white people still ruled. Jim Crow laws basically ensured a separation of black and white people in public. Black citizens were considered to be at the bottom of the socioeconomic scale. There were very few opportunities outside of the agricultural sector for black people living in the Delta. Even the social norms were different for black and white people. We probably all know the very basics of segregation, separate black and white public bathrooms, drinking fountains, restaurants, schools, seating on public transport, I could go on. But it was also common and very much expected of black people to refer to white people with respect. Mr, Mrs, Miss, Sir or Ma'am. They wouldn't be referred to in kind though. 
Black people were always to remain respectful, avoid eye contact, always looking at the ground when speaking, never offer to shake hands or make physical contact, and do not speak unless spoken to. Even when purchasing goods from a white store owner, black people were not to place the money directly in the owner's hand, but instead place it on the counter. All of this and more was just the norm in the Mississippi Delta. And this is where Emmett Till was planning on spending his summer holiday. Mamie warned her son of what would be expected of him down in the deep south, that things were very different down there, and he told her that he understood. And so he heads off to Money, Mississippi with his uncle Mose on August 21st, 1955. His cousins Wheeler Parker and Curtis Jones would also be joining him. The first couple of days Money went by with no trouble whatsoever. Emmett was having fun with his cousins and some local boys as well that he'd made friends with. It wasn't until August 24th that things went wrong. Emmett and Curtis decide to skip church that day and instead join their new friends to go and buy some sweets at the local store, Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market. Now this is where accounts of the story are disputed. Every source you read tells it a little bit differently. The narrative I've decided to take from here is from the FBI's report into the events as that is most likely the true version of events, or at least the version of events that later came out in the trial. Whether it is actually true or not is another discussion entirely. Emmett goes into the store to buy some sweets and then he exits. Shortly after he exits, a woman called Carolyn Bryant follows him out. She was a white woman, the wife of the owner of the store, and rumour has it that Emmett whistled at Carolyn. His cousins who were with him at the time knew that this was going to cause some trouble and so they rush away, dragging Emmett with them. They knew that this was going to come back on them. Emmett was always the centre of attention at home, so many friends, always pulling pranks, so it's likely that by whistling he just wanted to impress his new friends, get a laugh out of them, but it backfired. Other reports include accusations that Emmett made lewd comments towards Carolyn whilst in the store, or that he grabbed her and was menacing and sexually crude towards her. That's what Carolyn claimed at the trial, but years later while speaking to historian Timothy B. Tyson, she said that that part is actually not true. Not that it particularly matters anyway, no matter what Emmett did that day, he did not deserve what would happen to him. Mamie also later said that Emmett had problems with his speech. He suffered with a fairly pronounced stutter at times, and so she taught him to whistle to himself before pronouncing certain words to calm himself down. Although we'll never know the true reasoning behind this whistle, this could have also been a very big possibility. There was also a checkers game happening across the street, and it's thought that he could have also been whistling at the men playing checkers. On August 28th, 1955, at about 2.30am, Carolyn Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, and a J.W. Milam, his half-brother, appeared at the home of Mose Wright, where Emmett was staying with his cousins. They say they're looking for the boy who had done the talking in money, and they force their way inside the home past Mose. They find the room that Emmett is sleeping with, where he's sharing a bed with his cousin, and they abduct him from the home. Milam is armed with a pistol and he has a flashlight on him, and Mose tries to talk them out of it, telling them that Emmett was from the north, he didn't know any better. But they threatened Mose that he wouldn't reach his next birthday if he told anyone what they were doing. The men marched Emmett out to the truck and asked a person in the car if this was the boy, and Mose heard somebody say yes. He said it sounded like a lighter voice, a female voice. It's thought that this unidentified third person in the car may have been Carolyn herself. So the men tie him up and throw him in the back of the truck, driving away back towards money. Most waits on his porch for them to bring Emmett back. They're just teaching him a lesson, he thinks. Only, of course, Emmett never comes back home. Most of the friends drive around money looking for Emmett, but they're unsuccessful, driving home around 8am. He was scared to call the police for help, fearing for his life after they threatened to kill him. So it's actually Curtis Jones, Emmett's cousin, who places the call to the LaFleur County Sheriff and another to his mother back in Chicago. Curtis's mother is the one to call Mamie and let her know what's happened. So Bryant and Milam are soon brought in and questioned by the LaFleur County Sheriff, something that actually shocked most in his family. The fact that the police even followed up on a crime committed against a black person was surprising. It was even more surprising they were actually arrested for kidnapping. They admitted to the sheriff that they'd taken Emmett from his great uncle's yard, they said. But they also claimed that they'd released him that very same night in front of Bryant's store. They said they certainly hadn't seriously harmed him. What actually happened over the first few hours that Emmett was taken isn't known for certain. 
A man would later testify that about 6am he saw a white and green Chevrolet truck with four white men riding in the cab and three black men standing in the back of the truck. He also saw a black boy seated at the end of the truck. The truck parked in front of a barn and minutes later he said he heard hollering and whipping coming from inside. He would later identify Bryant and Milam as well as two of the black men. On August 31st, a naked, bloated body that was presumed to be Emmett's was found floating in a section of the Tallahatchie River, running along the border between Tallahatchie and Lafleur counties. A 75 pound cotton gym fan was tied with barbed wire to the neck of the body and there was extensive trauma to the head. It was later fully confirmed to be the body of Emmett Till. He was naked and his injuries were so severe that he was unrecognisable, along with the bloat from being in the water for several days. But he was wearing a silver ring with the initials LT and May 25th, 1943 carved into it. It had belonged to his father, Lewis Till. Mose Wright confirmed that it was definitely his great nephew through this ring. Upon discovery of the body, Bryant and Milan were both indicted on murder charges in Tallahatchie County. The trial would take place in Sumner the next month, with jury selection beginning on September 19th. Finding 12 unbiased jurors would not be an easy task. In 1955, none of the black residents of Tallahatchie were registered voters, of course, and thus none of them were eligible to serve as jurors. So the jury chosen was, of course, 12 white men. As of that point onwards, it was inevitable what the outcome of this trial was going to be. One of the defence attorneys later said, after the jury was chosen, any first year law student could have won the case. But by this point, the story of Emmett Till had gone national and then international. It wasn't just a normal trial, more than 70 reporters, some from as far away as London, packed into this courtroom and even more people waited outside. Why had Emmett's case hit national news? On September 3rd, 1955, Mamie had held her son's funeral, and it's the brave actions of this incredible woman that helped change the world. When Mamie travelled to Mississippi to identify her son's body, she was shocked. He'd been beaten to the point that he was unrecognisable, his face was swollen and distorted. And in that moment, she made a decision. She told the funeral director, let the people see what I've seen. Despite the protests of Mississippi officials who wanted a quick and quiet burial of the body, she takes her son home to Chicago and insists on an open casket, urging the world to look at her son's body, her 14-year-old son beaten beyond recognition. Mamie knew in order for Emmett's life to not be in vain, she needed to use that moment to illuminate the pains that black people across America endured. She personally helped push America towards the civil rights movement. The funeral was held at Roberts Temple Church of God in Chicago and tens of thousands of people turned up to pay their respects and in doing so they were forced to look at the swollen body of Emmett. It was a shocking sight to behold but these tens of thousands of people just wasn't enough. Jet Magazine was a weekly magazine that focused on the news, culture and entertainment within the African American community. It was read by a huge amount of the African-American population at the time, but it became nationally known in 1955 for its shocking and graphic coverage of the murder of Emmett Till. They published a photo of Emmett's corpse on the cover, inspiring the black community across the country to put up a fight, campaign for justice. Over the coming years, Jet Magazine would cover in detail every step of the burgeoning civil rights movement. Of course, the photos of Emmett's body are very easily accessible online. If you want to go and have a look, just give it a quick Google, they'll pop straight up. But I don't like to include photos of dead bodies on this channel because I just feel it's a bit gratuitous at points. And also, the photos of Emmett's body are particularly graphic and I don't want to shock anyone with that. So the funeral happened and by the time the trial started two weeks later, a huge amount of the country were aware of the name Emmett Till and what he'd gone through. A lot of the country was shocked but not so much in the Deep South. In fact, most of the white population of the Delta County sided with Milam and Bryant, who admitted that they did abduct Emmett that night, but they just didn't kill him, of course. Someone else must have done it after they left him outside the store. Emmett had just had a really bad night that night, just really bad luck. Mose Wright was the state's first witness, speaking on behalf of the prosecution. He testified that Milam and Brian had come into his home on August 28th and took Emmett away. When he was asked to identify the men, he pointed right at them from the stand. 
He also said that he identified the body from the river as being Emmett due to the ring on his finger that once belonged to his father. This was important because the prosecution had anticipated that the defence's main theory was going to be that the body removed from the river was not that of Emmett. An obvious defence to make as his face was so swollen. Mamie also took the stand and she testified, I positively identified the body in the casket and later on when it was on the slab as being that of my son Emmett Lewis Till. By the end of the prosecution witnesses, it was left with no reasonable doubt that Milan and Bryant had abducted Emmett. They'd admitted as much. And then there was very little doubt that they'd killed him that same night. There was even a surprise witness in the form of Willie Reed, the man who reported hearing licks and hollering from inside the barn that night. It was clear who had murdered Emmett. But on Thursday afternoon, the state rested and the defence presented its first witness in the form of Carolyn Bryant. She testified that it was just after dark that day and she was alone in the store with Emmett. He grabbed her hand as she put it out to collect the money. She said that she jerked her hand loose with much difficulty as Emmett asked her, how about a date baby? Apparently as she tried to walk away, Emmett grabbed her by the waist and said, you needn't be afraid of me, I've blank white woman before. The blank word here is just reported as being an unprintable word but we can probably take guesses as to what it might have been. Carolyn said that she was scared to death. As I've mentioned though, years later, I think in 2008, she admitted that this was all a lie. None of this happened. The judge ruled this evidence as inadmissible though, as every juror had undoubtedly heard Carolyn's story already anyway. It was a very small town and news traveled. So Carolyn's testimony didn't count for anything. The sheriff took the stand as a witness for the defence, where he claimed, based on his experience in the field, that the body found in the Tallahatchie River must have been there from 10 to 15 days. He said that the corpse was completely unidentifiable, and the man who embalmed Emmett's body also testified and backed this up, saying that it was bloated beyond recognition and it must have been in the water for at least 10 days. Rumours flew that the family were actually just hiding Emmett somewhere. They were just doing all of this because they wanted to inflict pain on white people for no apparent reason. Looking back, you can tell that nobody ever really believed that the body pulled out of the river was not that of Emmett Till. But they needed a reasonable doubt for the jury and this was it. At the closing arguments, the district attorney said for the prosecution, they murdered that boy and to hide that dastardly, cowardly act, they tied barbed wire to his neck and to a heavy gin fan and dumped him into the river for the turtles and the fish. Whereas the defense attorney simply said to the jurors, every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to set these men free. Which loosely translated to, you're white men, are you really gonna let these other white men go down for the murder of a black boy? The jurors went in to deliberate and they were told by the sheriff to at least wait a while before coming out to make it look good. The truth is the jurors had had their mindset and a verdict before the trial even started. There was no way that Brian and Milan were ever going to be convicted. The 12 jurors just relaxed for an hour and joined cans of coke before returning 68 minutes later to announce the verdict of not guilty. And of course, six weeks later, a LaFleur County grand jury also refused to indict Brian and Milam on kidnapping charges, and both men were released from custody, completely free. Black people across America were furious, and it sparked something. People were not willing to take this sitting down. A 14-year-old boy had been lynched in 1955, and nobody was paying for it. Many say that this is what sparked the beginning of the civil rights movement in the South. Whilst the movement had been growing for many years in other parts of the country, it had been kind of delayed down there. Within four years of the murder trial, over 21% of the black population had left Tallahatchie County. And this wasn't just on Emmett's behalf, it seemed that the two men getting away with Emmett's murder gave white men in the county a free pass. White on black crime, including murder, increased exponentially over the coming years. For Milam and Bryant though, their freedom came at a price. Bryant's store catered almost exclusively to the local black population who would stop in at the store after long days working in the cotton fields. This black population just stopped shopping there and within 15 months the store had closed down due to a lack of customers. The Milams owned a farm on which black people from then on refused to work. And so Milam had to turn to crime to make a living. They were desperate for money. Which is why in January 1956 they turned to Look magazine and sold their story. 
The magazine headlined it, The Shocking Story of Approved Killing in Mississippi by William Bradford Huey. The editor's note at the beginning of the article read, in the long history of man's inhumanity to man, racial conflicts have produced some of the most horrible examples of brutality. The recent slaying of Emmett Till in Mississippi is a case in point. The editors of Look are convinced they are presenting here for the first time the real story of that killing. The story no jury heard and no newspaper reader saw. That's right, in this article, both men confessed to murdering Emmett. But with double jeopardy laws in the state of Mississippi, they knew that regardless of confession, they could not be rearrested and retried for either the murder or the kidnap. Of course, I'll leave the article linked down below along with the rest of my sources, so you can have a read of it if you want to. But it's worth bearing in mind that this article is still full of lies, it's full of poor justification for their crimes. But to summarise, the article says Emmett had apparently been bragging about a white girl he was friends with back in Chicago, apparently showing his friends a picture of this said girl that he carried around in his wallet. His friends dared him to go into the store and try and get a date with a white woman that worked in there. We know what apparently happened from here on out, what Carolyn said at the trial, that Emmett went inside and flirted with her. Then apparently, according to the article, a cousin ran in and apparently grabbed Emmett to try and stop him. And then Carolyn followed them out of the store, heading to a car to get her gun. We now know none of this to be true. Witnesses who were at the scene said that there was never any photograph, never any bragging, and certainly never any grabbing of Carolyn. All that potentially happened was a whistle, whether it was directed at Carolyn or not. So Milam and Bryant said in the article that they drove around with Emmett in their truck that night for nearly three hours, but at no point was Emmett afraid of them. They took him into the barn and began pistol whipping him around the head. According to them, Emmett said, you bastards, I'm not afraid of you, I'm as good as you are, I've had white women, my grandmother was a white woman. Whether this is true or not, we'll never really know because they're the only witnesses to this, but we can probably agree that it's very unlikely that Emmett said this. Milo is quoted as saying in the article, when a black person gets close to mentioning sex with a white woman, he's tired of living. I'm likely to kill him. Me and army folks fought for this country and we got some rights. I stood there in that shed and listened to that boy throw that poison at me and I just made up my mind. Only, of course, he was not calling Emmett a boy or a black person in this. I've tidied up the language quite a lot. It was a lot more racist. Milam said that he decided he needed to act and he needed a wait. He remembered the local cotton gin had recently installed new equipment and so there was a discarded gin fan nearby. It would have weighed about £75. Apparently at this point Emmett wasn't bleeding very much and they order him back into the truck and head off to steal this fan. They were really worried about getting caught stealing, but not about what they were about to do after that. They then drive towards the river to a secluded spot that Milam knew of. Apparently they told Emmett to carry the fan to the riverbank and take off his clothes, which he did. Milam then shoots him, the bullet hitting him above the right ear. I think I failed to mention before actually that he'd been found with a bullet wound in his head. They then use barbed wire to attach the gin fan around his neck and they roll him into the water. They then took his clothes and burned them. And they confess this murder to a national magazine. Imagine having that much faith that you're never going to be punished for it. It's likely that a lot of this is embellished or untrue. The dialogue likely didn't happen as they say it did, but the murder almost certainly happened as they said. The lack of fear and regret felt by these men was astounding. They took the life of a 14 year old boy and believed they were doing the right thing. They had no reason to feel remorse, nobody telling them they'd done wrong, including the justice system. Whilst they failed to say it in the article, other men also participated in the beating, as I previously mentioned, but also none of them ever faced any charges. The interview caused an explosive reaction across the country. Who on earth is so sure of themselves, so sure of their superiority, they would confess to murder in a national magazine with zero fear of repercussion? It became incredibly clear that America had failed. Civil rights leaders across the country leap into action and push the federal government to investigate this case. It contributed to the passing of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which authorised the US Department of Justice to intervene in local law enforcement issues when individual civil rights were being compromised. This article even caused reactions back in the Delta, Mississippi. Many people who had supported Bryant and Milam, thinking that they'd been set up by the black community, saw them for what they really were, finally. 
Sure, the majority of the white South was still incredibly racist at this point, but as for most people, murder was a step too far, particularly murder of a child. Brian and Milam were outcasts from society and found it just impossible to earn any money whatsoever. Even when they moved to Texas for a fresh start, their infamy followed them. Texas was so difficult that eventually they had to move back to Mississippi when nobody had forgotten what they'd done. Milam, as I said, turned to crime and he ended up dying in 1980 at the age of 61 due to spinal cancer. Brian and Carolyn eventually ended up divorcing at some point and he lived in fear of the different new generation coming to get him and so he lived as private life as possible. He died in 1994 at the age of 63 again from cancer. Over the coming years, Mamie spent all of her time continuing to educate people about her son's murder. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks boarded a bus and sat down. When the bus driver noticed a number of white passengers standing, he asked Rosa to move seats. She said, when that white driver stepped back towards us, when he waved his hand and ordered us up and out of our seats, I felt a determination cover my body like a quilt on a winter night. She also later said, I thought of Emmett Till and I just couldn't go back. Rosa Parks and her refusal to move seats on the bus that day is one of the defining moments of the civil rights movement. And without the murder of Emmett Till, without the bravery of his mother putting her son's body on display for the world to see, there's a chance this may never have happened. In 2004, the Department of Justice reopened the case of Emmett Till. By this point, of course, both Bryant and Milam were long dead, but Carolyn Bryant was alive. She is still alive to this very day. In 2005, Emmett's body was exhumed and autopsied by the Cook County Coroner and it was finally positively, scientifically identified as Emmett for the very first time. So much for the defense's argument at trial that it wasn't ever his body at all. He was also found at this point to have extensive cranial damage, a broken left femur and two broken wrists. The investigation was reopened on May 7, 2004 in an effort to determine if other individuals were involved in these crimes and to bring forth state indictments against these individuals if they were. However, in 2007, a LaFleur County Grand Jury, which was now composed primarily of black jurors and impaneled by a black prosecutor, found no credible basis for the claims up to 14 people took part in the murder. That same grand jury also failed to find sufficient cause for charges against Carolyn Bryant. I've already mentioned that Carolyn eventually admitted that her testimony was not true. This all came out in 2017, but was actually from an interview that took place in 2008. However, as she never testified this in front of the jury, only the court spectators, and the judge had ruled it as inadmissible anyway, there had been no crimes committed. And even if there had been, it was only perjury for which the statute of limitations ran out in 1958. She later said, nothing that boy did could ever justify what happened to him. Carolyn's admission, although it had no legal repercussions, was huge to the Till family though. It mattered to them that she admitted her lies. It's important to understand the power of words of a white person against a black person at this time. How terrible history is. In a report to Congress in March 2018, the US Department of Justice stated that once again it was reopening the investigation due to unspecified new information. Although I can't be certain, it does seem like this new information was the release of the book The Blood of Emmett Till by historian Timothy Tyson. It's in this book that he includes the interview with Carolyn where she admits to lying. That's definitely enough to get an investigation reopened, I'd say. The latest update I can find on this is in an article on The Guardian published just last week as I'm filming this video, 25th of April 2020. It reports that the reinvestigation could be wrapped up in the next few weeks. The Till family are still anxiously awaiting the news of the outcome of this FBI investigation, but to this day, no one has ever been charged or spent a single second in prison for the murder. No one has ever paid. The FBI has kept very quiet about the inquiry and we're just gonna have to wait and see what comes out of it, but it's unlikely there's gonna be much. It'll be difficult to prosecute Carolyn for lying this many years later, plus she's so old now, there's just not much point. The Till family are just hoping for a public admission of lying and perhaps even an apology. I did read that apparently Carolyn has written a memoir that isn't to be publicly released until 2036 at the earliest. Whilst researching this video, I was shocked to find out there is no federal anti-lynching law in the United States, something which lawmakers have tried to address numerous times on the federal level. They're trying to get the Justice for Victims of Lynching Act passed to make it a federal crime, Finally, a law in memory of Emmett and other black women, children, and men who have been lynched throughout history. 
The family just want the truth now. No one's ever going to get prosecuted and Mamie Till passed back in 2003. Emmett's cousins are now heading the fight. I think they just want public acknowledgement, a public apology, confession. But sadly, it's unlikely they'll ever get it as Carolyn Bryan's family is now denying that she ever admitted to lying. The weight of the words back then of a white woman against a black man was astonishing. And there's still a way to go now towards equality in so many parts of the world. Racism isn't gone. Racism very much still exists. We still see it every single day. People still die due to racism every single day around the world and in the USA. Just today, it's not always as blatant and in your face as it was in the Deep South in the 1950s. But scary though, sometimes it still is. And that's the heartbreaking story of Emmett Till. This only happened 65 years ago. That really is not that long ago. Don't make the mistake of thinking that just because we're in 2020 now, things are so much better because they're really, really not. The world still has so long to go towards equality, but we are getting there slowly but surely. I just think it's so important to speak up against injustice and inequality when you see it happening, especially if you're a person of privilege. I always get people moaning whenever I do social justice videos, I'm um, just being a social justice warrior and all this, and like, I just don't see how it's a bad thing. I think it's really important to talk about cases like this, to bring awareness to stuff like this and make people aware that this kind of stuff still happens today. And if you have the ability to speak up against it, then you probably should. Thank you so much for watching this video. If there's any other similar cases that you would like me to talk about, then please, as always, leave them in the comments down below. Um, make sure you subscribe to my channel if you like what I'm doing here and maybe check out channel memberships and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.